Once upon a time in Hollywood. Yeah, and we are live. And okay. I, I can't. I can't. I can't believe it. John Van Hammersfeld, a uh, a legend in my own time. Here Absolutely. On, here on you've got Mel. Yeah. Hi, Mel. How are you? Uh, well, I'm a I'm in a bit of trepidation here because you know if you were in Britain you'd be Sir John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and, unfortunately, and, uh, the U.S. doesn't do that. You know, and, okay, but I, I'm Canadian, so I can bestow upon you. Yeah, you this, can do that. Yeah, some kind of knighthood. Um, and the, among the many incredible things you've done, well, it's like, it's sixty years of work. It's sixty years of work, and each decade changes as the economy changes and all the people change. So the work was probably for se for 17 years, the 60s and 70s was in the music business. And then I had to leave that because they uh, uh, went to disc and um, MTV and that was the end of that that style of promotion and campaigns and all that. Well, we're gonna the go album back cover, to the album cover went away, you know, and the, the stores accepted the tapes and they made more money. And that yeah. was the end of it. But we're gonna go back to 1965 in a minute, but before that, the show has to begin with a jingle. Oh, okay. Every good show needs a jingle. And here is our jingle. Are you ready, John? Get yeah. Out. <laughs> Grab a seat, or we'll sweep you off your feet. We move, we groove, you got Mel. Ease your legs, rest a while, all you gotta do is smile. We're swell, can't you tell you got Mel? When the show begins, you better hold on real tight. Or before you know it, you'll be high as a kite. Take a break, settle down, we're the only show in town. It's our road, don't you know you got Mel? Give it up, don't think twice, we're a hurricane on ice. What the hell, give a yell, ring your bell, show and tell. Mademoiselle, give a smell, you got Mel. You've got Mel. Get there we chill. go. Once is enough. And Mel has the incredible John Van Hammersfeld. So, so John, I want to start in 1965, if I may. Okay. Um, you get a job as head of design of Capitol Records, and you go uh, that, on. Uh, 67. 67. Yeah. Okay. 60, 65. I'm. Uh, uh, I'm at Chouinard Art School. Okay. So Studying for about a year. Okay. Yeah. You go which on. Was a, which was the uh, starting of the multidiscipline, where I was a photographer, an artist, and, and a graphic designer. The graphic designer um, did very well to keep the studio um, constantly fed. And then I could still do my other work in art and, and uh, uh, photography. Okay. But, you know, even given your tremendous background as a student, you, in 1967, are doing things like designing uh, the record of the, uh, the, the Jacket of Magical Mystery Tour and uh, the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead. And the, the list goes on and on. Hundreds of records that you designed. But yes, when you, right. When, when you join Capitol Records, you're maybe, I don't know, 25 years old. Yeah, 25. Just what, 25. John, what's, what's that all about? <laughs> Share <laughs> that with us. The, it's the ironic because they had done the Endless Summer poster and it was really big in New York. The, the vice president of the CRDC knew about it. And when I interviewed with George Osaki in the art department, well, art services, it was called. He, he, when I showed him the poster, he reached over into his cabin and he pulled out the um, Endless Summer su um, soundtrack. And so I didn't say a word. He assumed that I did album covers. So they hired me. And that, what, that was in 1967? Yeah, in 67. And the art department, most of the people were the you know older and they weren't a part of my generation. And, and I had, um, I was more, um, but most of my friends were four years younger. So I was in that, gen, uh, you know, the 64 or no, the, the 44, 43, 44, you know, Clapton, 
Jagger, you know, all, all, the, all the, you know, the Beatles are all like around 20, 27. And so, um, um, so it just, I fell into it. It was just great. And I was always like four years older than they were, but they, I always looked young to them, you know, so. So, so John, uh, how did this happen? So somebody just came over to you and said, um, uh, John, we have this uh, Beatles album coming out. Can you do the, uh, can you do the cover? How did this happen? Oh, okay. So I'm at my in, I'm in my office and I get this call from Jerome Nags, who's the vice president of the CRDC, who signed the Beatles to the label. And so they, they um, um, and and so he says, "Here, come upstairs." You know, so they didn't want they didn't like us taking the elevator, so we had to go up these uh, the escal or the, um, the the stairs in, inside the building. So I get up to the store, get up to the uh, um, you know, the hallway there, and I'm going down the hallway, and the door is partially open, and I see Brown Meggs in his blue suit and his white shirt and his black tie, and kind of in pain, you know. And so as I arrive, I look down at the table, and he points at the table, which is the the little EP, which has the Beatles on there, but as the walrus and you know these masks on, and he says we can't sell this, you know, I mean, where are the Beatles? You know, because they always had photographs. Was this, was photographs. The, this was the little EP from Britain? Yeah, yeah, the EP. Yeah, yeah that small, like eight yeah. inch. The, the like 40, 45s. Uh, little, it's a little long player. You know, ah, long I mean, play, but the small ones. Yeah, but the small ones. So, uh, so he says, uh, you know, uh, Epstein has committed suicide, John. There's no management. And normally, you know, EMI sends us uh, all the pictures and things to, to assemble of a campaign. So why don't you take it home? Do you understand this whole psychedelic thing, which is I, I don't quite understand it either, but you're from that scene, you know, and you smoke pot, so you understand this. <laughs> so I go home to the studio and, you know, within about, um, you know, that night and the next day, the color key is delivered to the office and I take it up to Brown <clears throat> and Brown begs this, oh God, this is really great, you've done it. I'm not gonna tell the president, I'm just gonna go print it. And that was it. And you're just a kid. Yeah, I'm just a kid, yeah. Well, I'm the same age as John Lennon. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So the next thing you know, in the fall of, uh... 1967 magical mystery tour comes out the lp in the states and you are all over it to this very day did, john did you feel the import of what you were doing at that time no no i didn't because my uh my world was more important than that my generation my world yeah and so what i did is i um, had two partners and i created a dance hall shrine exposition hall and, and uh, about 43 some odd groups went through the, through the promotion and the posters and the advertising and all that for about a year. And then, and then there was a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, the, it was called the Brotherhood, you know, uh, which was in Laguna Beach and they were drug dealers and, and they got, got us all confused, you know, in their, in their world, you know, the, the half, half the audience was their world and the other half was probably from LA. So it really got confusing. Too many drugs, too many people passing out, you know all that. So we uh, had we were um, fronted by uh, Starkist Tuna. They had put up all the money, like one hundred and fifty thousand, something like that. And so we had to pay them back, you know. But then we had this drug money uh, that kept coming in because the you know because the drug dealers wanted to take their girlfriends to the uh, to the shows, but they wanted to be they wanted to meet the cream. They wanted to be in the dressing room. So they'd pay $10,000. And so you'd get the suitcase, you know, and, and, <laughs> and uh, it came in very handy because there was all, you always had to pay in advance to book the groups. So, um, so the, so the, the Beatles, the, so the Beatle thing, uh, um, you know, by October is being released and I'm just starting uh, and I've been working for like three months or something like that. I'm just starting the Shrine Exposition Hall dance halls. You know, so the first the first scene is the Buffalo Springfield, uh, the Grateful Dead, and Blue Cheer. 
you know, which are California groups, you know, and and uh, it just blew everybody's mind. And then and Brown Meigs didn't know what to do. You know, I, I said, I'm going to go with this. I'm sorry. This is more interesting to me. And that's the that's the transition into uh, the the the, uh, the music business. So I must have met every manager you wanted to know that had something to do with London or L.A. or New York. You know, so uh, they were all you know friendly and and I all first naming and and all you know it was just a political scene that I acquired. So when it was over, I still knew the managers, and so then I went to work in the uh, the. Uh, not for capital, but for like five or six different labels as an independent studio. So uh, being that I was multidisciplined, I didn't have to worry about drawing, design, or photography. So, and then the business itself is each cover that comes out as it goes up the, the, the charts, um, the last thing you want to do is have a cover that's on top there. You'll never work again unless you do something different. So the style had a lot to do with it. Now, Norman Seek was my partner in a lot of it. And, uh, and so he had a style and they, people loved that style. So he was constantly um, you know, in shootings for, in the morning, afternoon and uh, evening, but he was also making a film at the same time. He was filming all the groups. And so, yeah. it, you know, so it was very exciting, you know, uh, all the way up until, you know, from 65 to 75. And then in 75, it kind of slowed down because of this new technology, the digital technology coming in and the studios turning to digital rather than analog. And in that metamorphosis, uh, I, I, uh, I just sort of left the business, and, but I was in other businesses. So I became a, um, I went, uh, actually I started teaching school, which gave me an overview. And so I was with these famous artists, um, uh, at Cal Arts, and so uh, I was in design, you know, and they were in art, and the departments were together, so it was the art and design department. So the politics of, of the art world was right there. You had all the big names, you know? and, and then I had this whole career from the uh, record business or from the entertainment business with movie posters and all that, but I never told anybody about it. Because uh, a lot of my students say, why did you talk about it? I said, well, I just wanted to keep it in my vernacular as a, as a uh, instructor and just teach you how to be a designer, an artist, or a filmmaker. Okay, but John, so now the truth is out. I mean, everybody knows you designed hundreds of albums and uh, you kept uh, reinventing yourself as you did it. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so I designed, <laughs> I designed the signage for... Um, um, Broadway, uh, through the Broadway Deli, which was in Santa Monica, but the big one was uh, Contempo Casuals. And, that, and I started out with one store and there were 250 stores by, by 10 years later, and then they sold out to Wet Seal. So then uh, I did the Fatburger um, chain for, uh, of all people, Chris Blackwell, who had uh, acquired it and was, you know, uh, from two black fellows, you know, and because he was from Jamaica, he felt he was giving them an opportunity, you know, in LA. So that that uh, trademark is now there's 200 stores around the world in Dubai and in China, you know, in uh, um, Beijing. So then uh, um, around around 84, 85, uh, I was working on the Olympics, doing a big, huge mural for them and a poster and all that and meeting with all the very various people at that level. And then uh, at the other door uh, was Jimmy Z, these two guys who wanted uh, to make these trunks. Uh, so, so that started a whole new phenomenon. That was like the record business. So for about 10 years, I was a consultant to all these different uh, labels of, of uh, making clothing. And then that kind of burned out. And then I went on to Fat Burger and that. And then I, um, then I became a more of a designer of everything. And then as I got into 2000, uh, into the digital world, I became an artist and a designer and a photographer. Um, and so I started having art shows and photography shows. And, uh, and the internet really, you know, 
promoted me and even through Facebook, you know, people would know me. But I guess the real classic is uh, 2000, 2009 and 10. Uh, I get a call from Las Vegas and Alita and I go up there and we make a deal with them. So we have a store and then they have this huge 1500 uh, foot screen uh, on, on, uh, you know, on the old, uh, on the old, you know, I guess old, uh, old uh, Las Vegas strip. So when you arrive there, there's this huge dome over the street that goes up 1500 feet. So I, I was taken in by them and, and we animated uh, all my symbols and things and everything into a show, which was called the Signs of Life. And Science of Life ran for like eight years, you know, 80 million people saw it. So it was like doing a movie, you know, a short seven minute movie. So it's a little bit in the same context as the 11 minute movie we have today, you know, the Tourget did that you saw. Yeah. Wonderful. Crazy world, ain't it? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you are a, a, an icon who has uh, designed icons. <laughs> you know, in the design world, they probably don't know. That's what's so funny about it, you know, because it's always the designer is not the point. It's the companies, the logos, you know, and, and no one wants to see the designer's name anywhere because they want, all want to take credit. The agency wants to take credit, the president of the company, the vice president, everybody. So in the strata of doing business with those corporations, you know, they're like, as I was told, they were like pyramids, you know, and you have all the all the workers at the bottom and then towards the top you have management and then at the very top you have the president and the accountant and that's where i worked so i had to bypass all these people constantly who got in the way and they wanted a little piece of this and that <laughs> so even getting to the top then then the management hates you so my credit disappears and then they assume what i've done Incredible. it was very it was quite a life, really, in in, the, in corporations, the way they work. A a absolutely. Um, I, can you say a few words about your childhood? Where did you grow up? Where does your name come from? What were you like as a little kid? Uh, so Ben Hammersfeld. And, 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 and John, what music did you listen to? Oh, before what music did I listen before, to? Before the Beatles. Jazz and the Stones and all that, you know. I mean, you know, all those records that in the 60s, because I was doing these groups and everything, I was very well informed. No, but as a kid. But, in the, in the, I always liked the, jazz. And, yeah. and, and, and as a kid, um, you know, growing, growing, coming from the East, let's say my, let's say my grandfather comes from Holland uh, to Pennsylvania and he works for um, uh, Westinghouse, you know, and then he moves to the more, more the Roaring Twenties in in uh, um, uh, in Cleveland, and then he gets a job as an inventor, a ventures uh, engineer, which he had studied uh, art and and science in art school. So he gets on a train every week for five days, and he's in New York at, at the Mayfair Hotel, entertaining all these different uh, designers who do prototypes, you know, because he spoke five different languages. And then on the weekends, he'd bring them back to the house and take them out to various places into the major company, uh, Warren War Swayze, where they made all the machines mm -hmm. uh, and machine guns and telescopes and all kinds of different things. So he was really informed. He knew all the people, all the presidents, all the different labels and everything. So he had two sons and and one was an architect and the other was an engineer. My father was the engineer. So um, the tragedy was that my mother and father um, one day were jumping off of a boat into the Chesapeake Bay. And as, as my father the next day caught uh, polio. And so he was taken to Warm Springs and my uh, grandparents came down on a train and on the way back, they had a, there was a wreck and they broke all their arms and they were you know, paid off by the corporation. And my father was uh, at Warm Springs for like about three years, three or four years. And, and so they, I had to be separated. I was raised by nuns and my mother uh, had to separate from, that, from my father. So all three of us were just like at, at a distance for about uh, maybe two years or something like that. And I was an infant. I was like six months old when I first started there. 
So as we came out of that, my grandfather was wealthy. So he took care of us. <laughs> and so he set up a whole sort of thing in, in um, Maryland there, uh, in Taos in a house and all that. And then there came a point where my father, uh, you know, the place that he was working at, the designers were going to uh, LA to Hawthorne to work on the flying wing. And so he um, actually the, the ski, uh, the ski, the head ski, that one of those designers was in his team, which is an interesting thing that happened. Um, so then from there, um, my grandfather and my father and my grandmother, they drive out, they buy a, a Pontiac, 50 Pontiac, and they drive across the US you know, to, to uh, uh, LA and they get all set up and everything. And there's a house set up for us. And, and my mother and I arrive <coughs> on the train at the LA station. And as I walk out, you know, it's sort of the, uh, the, the air is really heavy and, and thick and yellow and, and sort of uh, orange, you know, with these palm trees, you know, very, in, the complete opposite of where I came from, you know, where it's relatively clean and you have rain and snow, but it's, uh, but, you know, everything is crystal clear. So here there's an ambiance, a sort of filter over everything. So my sister and I, uh, you know, uh, end up, you know, going to school in Westchester. And, um, and so I, uh, uh, I'm in school there. And so my father then, my grandfather builds a house in Palos Verdes in Litnala Bay. So I can really see the anxiety my mother has in this whole kind of arrangement. You know, it was completely the opposite of what she got into. She wanted an ideal family that she saw in the Van Hammersfelds. And here she was, you know, with a, with a cripple, you know. Uh, so we all had to compensate for my father and he had braces and he had crutches and he had hand controls. And he had a car, you know, he was a big guy. He built, built himself up, he had big suits, hats and everything and, uh, and worked at uh, uh, Northrop Aviation on all these different projects, you know, uh, jet airplanes and, and uh, satellites and wings and this and that. And he was a metallurgist, metallurgist at that point. So as the as the uh, planes went faster and faster, had to, the wings had to had to uh, withstand the the forces. So they had to change the metal and the rivets and everything. So he specialized in that. And so later in life, when he was uh, around oh, 65 or something like that, he was uh, he became a part of the uh, uh, the stealth bomber. So they designed the first um, plastic airplanes. Wow. You know, which were totally digital, you know, in 19, from 60 to, to 1970, something like that. And then, and then, uh, then that became more sophisticated and, and, the, and the internet came in and, and they didn't work with faxes anymore and everything was uh, in a different world. So my father retired. So how, how did you become a, uh, a designer, a photographer, an artist? Your dad well, my mother, my mother's an artist and my father's an engineer, you know, so uh, those two sciences, those two uh, different things I could actually see into all the time. You know? So my father would buy a camera. I would always see the films and the cameras that my grandfather had. So that was easy. And then my mother showed me how, what, what art was. And then I went to Art Center College of Design, which marries the two together as design. That's incredible. Okay, now back to the 60s. How many of these uh, bands did you know? I mean, you, you did covers for the Rolling Stones and well, the here, Boys. The, yeah, the Jefferson Airplane. The Jefferson, Jefferson Airplane. airplane. Is, yeah, that comes after the Beatles. Yeah. And then uh, there's, uh, of all things, uh, the Pop Art Experimental Band. There's a uh, a very famous album cover for them. And then I was doing the posters, you know, which then yeah. people would see and, and the airplane would, uh, you know, see the posters and everything. And that's how I ended up with uh, doing that cover. And then as it went into the seventies, um, uh, you know, at the end of that decade, everything was crumbling and changing and everything. And the last thing you wanted to uh, be associated with, with it was, was a, a culture that you once were a part of. Well, the crazy part of it is that the holding companies, 
that make up the financial aspects of uh, American corporate life. They were buying up all the information from the 60s. So then they had all this information. So then they had to figure out how to, how to exploit it. And so the, the 70s is about, is about the remake of everything, you know, the, like the greatest hits of the, of the Grateful Dead. Yeah. But John, so how many of these bands and persona did you meet? Did I usually they... met them. I met their management, you know. Uh, the bands are very mysterious, you know. They're not uh, up on the same level as the, uh, as the executives are, you know. So your, your relationship is more with uh, someone leading you through the particular things, you know, which was the manager or the producer. And then you, you, you know, yes, you'd be introduced to Jimi Hendrix or you'd be introduced to, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, say um, uh, Grace Slick would come to the house, you know, come to the studio. Uh, One second, and, you, met, you met Grace Slick? Yeah, she would come to the studio. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, and, and where uh, um, and she'd leave Canter behind. It was always fun like that, you know. Um, and then, you know, with the Stones, that was like a, you know, that was like a month with the Stones, all th all five of them. And you know, Charlie went to art school, so I had rapport with him. Jagger was like a couple of years younger. He liked my attitude. Uh, you know, Keith, Keith Richards is kind of quiet. You know, always stoned on uh, in heroin, you know, and uh, it was, you know, it was a big parade of money and 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 clothing and cars and women and drugs. You know, just every, you know, it was just like a, uh, a an economy in its own way until it sort of ended. You know, it all collapsed down into this digital world. Yeah, but you know, John. Was, I have to I have to ask you this, you see, because you were also lucky, I think, because you came on to record albums when when the design was it was, you know, like when I was a young kid, LPs were throwaways. They were like second class. Citizens. OK, so we'll explain that compared to the yeah. 45s. Yeah, so that has a lot to do with their business, which comes from the 50s, where the record was a souvenir, basically, for the, for, Dan, uh, for Frank Sinatra or King, not King Cole, something like that. That's Capitol Records. Yeah. And, uh, and then they had, and they had their own distribution. It was always very small. So when the Beatles came about, you know, the single then went to a, 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 a laminated cover mm -hmm. and, and a whole new market opened up. And they couldn't make them fast enough, so then they went to cardboard, fold in, fold up cardboard, and these big sheets of paper that were, you know, thirty by sixty, and they would do multiples, and it'd come off this big press, and they'd chop them up and laminate them together, and so that created a new kind of package, uh, which was entirely different, you know. And then where the liner notes were done by one party in the corporation and the art was done by another another group and the photography with another group. So all, all the, what the new cover did is it brought all together. They all fought really hard. And then these various designers became princes, you know, of the record business. And the prince would go out to see the kings and the kings would give, give uh, their best wishes to the princes and the princes will make the covers, you know? And so you had, uh, you know, all, all these different designers. So it got really competitive, you know, in the, in the mid seventies, it was like outrageous, you know, and they started put, putting books out of all the album covers. So when, were, do you, when, when do you feel, John, that, that the LP, because I have some LPs, you know, I teach a course to hundreds of students who are still interested in sixties music. And um, you were there at, at the beginning of the 60s, the LP, the design wasn't maybe that important. But you had two things going on. You know, Rolling Stone wanted advertising. So they went to Warner Brothers and they said, oh, we'll run ads and we'll price that out, you know. And then they went to Tokyo and they went into the electronic people and they talked to them and they put ads. So essentially the corporations joined into a kind of a fellowship around these different magazines and advertising that went to a, went to all these kids, 
uh, and then there were commercials and this and that. And so that exploded. You know, so you where you had where in 1965 you had a little box, you know, that used to play 45s, and all of a sudden there's a 33 and a third, and you have to and you have and then you had to take the spool out and have a special thing and then place it in there. And so that was good. Everybody could have a record, everyone could have their own sound system. All right, so then then came the big hardware, you know, where you have Jimi Hendrix with this sound and this conversation about the sound. Um, what is it? The, um, uh, the festival in uh, Monterey, the Monterey, uh, you know, uh, the Monterey um, uh, Jazz Festival I went to probably in 65. And then so, so by 67, that's only two years later, all of a sudden, there are all these groups that are taking, are like a fellowship, they all come together and, and Lou Adler makes a film out of it and it becomes a, a whole new world. So that's one way it exploded. So the sound became really important. They could see Jimi Hendrix in this new sound. They could see Janis Joplin. You could see uh, um, Grace Slick, you know, doing her uh, voice uh, control things. So, and those, those so each, yeah, each so area, you know, the sound was developing with hardware. The album cover was changing, you know, to the board pack so they could make more. Then, then where do you sell them? The Tower Records comes along, Licorice Pizza, Licorice Pizza, you know, and a couple other labels, and then small record well, small record stores and communities just exploded too as well. Um, so, so where, you know, so you're you're in you're in 1974, and and you've been in it for four years and it's just exploded, and and you realize that these records are just insane. You know, they, they send them out in big stacks and they sit in stores, you know, and then they coordinate it with, this, with because of the, uh, the barcode, they could coordinate it with the concert and the media. So, they, so the record label uh, had, had knew every album that sold and who sold it. And they had computers to log it all. So it was all really controlled, you know, and managed everything. So it became, uh, they became greedy. And so they started sending too many records and too many different groups where it all exploded and came back at them. And so as the records came back, they lost a dollar on every album. So out of their profits. So it was a little bit like the magazine business. You put a, uh, one magazine on the stand and it's a hit. And then you put another magazine on the stand and it's not, then that cancels out your profit. So then the record stores were having to deal, you know, which the, the record stores was, you know, it was a piece of real estate and they were dependent upon what they call rack choppers who came from the labels, you know, with the product, the wholesale product. And they would come in and then feed the bins, you know, so that was all, you know, uh, being corrupted as well, you know, where they were, things were coming back to the, the, uh, the the rack jobbers and they were upset and they'd go to the corporation and yell and scream, why does your record come back and I lose my profit? So, so you know, in business, you have to say, uh, you the album, you know, the plastic costs you money, then you have to package it and then you have to put cellophane on it, then you have to put it in a box, you know, and then you have to set up the orders and then the boxes go out to uh, at wholesale. Well, there's a lot of money lost just in that process, you know? So then it's in wholesale. So then the label, the uh, store gets it. And then the store is uh, in, this, in this position where they have to sell it to get their money out of it. And if it doesn't sell, they're pissed off and they charge back a dollar, which then goes back to the distributor and then, go, you know, to the, uh, to the rat jobber and, then, the, and then, to, then to the corporation. All right, now the corporation doesn't really have money. They have rich people who use it as a casino. And then in the casino, all this money is lent to the companies. You know? And so the company is carrying a huge debt. And the last thing in the world they want is the, is the economy to go down. Because then, then all these rich people get upset because they don't see their money coming in. And so the label has to sell to another company. So you then, so then, you know, Warner Brothers would be, was being sold to uh, Warner Communications, and then they were 
pulling all these different Atlanta and, and, uh, and Warner and whatever, all those different labels together in one. And, and, and so really, um, you know, around 78 or something like that, they were, you know, they were uh, basically trying to get away with 600 records being produced and, and sent to, uh, to market with promotions and, and that all collapsing. You know, so the record business has really had a tough time, you know, because of the electronic thing. Yes, they, they were able to make a disc and they could get $19 rather than $5.50. And then, and, and then along comes uh, the internet and they take that, they take those, those songs and sell them for free. You know, it was just the poor record business and the rich, you know, where it used to be a great casino, you know, they're a little leery now. But the internet now, you know, something like Warner, uh, something like uh, Sony, Sony will make billions of dollars now off the Beatles because um, Michael Jackson sold them all the music credits. You know, so the only thing corporations had is the song the rights to the song. And those are the things that were sold to yeah. the next label. And then, and then the bands are trying to buy them back. So they had control and they had an income coming in. So then you had the tours. So then they went to tours and the record companies, you know, uh, were really upset, you know, and, uh, that they didn't have control over that. So the bands really were going on the road and the site and, the, and the, any money on the record was a throwaway. So you had all these changes happening over the over that 17 years so john but but you know the years from 67 i hope that's all coherent yeah it, but these are like these are the big years of of uh of rock music and you were there uh yeah. what i want to ask you now is what what message do you have uh for my students for the for the young people studying engineering studying design what is, what is your take on a successful career You've had an amazingly successful career over so many changes in various industries. What's your message to young people? Well, it's called um, what is it called? It's called multiform. Called multiform. That's the kind of the uh, you went through uh, uh, the Bauhaus and you went through postmodern. So so now it's uh, called multiform. Okay, what multiform is, is it's being able to know what, the, what it was like before the internet with analog and then knowing what digital is today. Being able to, to work in those two forms and put that together and put that into the internet. So this is the- uh, so, that's, so the learning is much different. You really have to, you can't get away with just working on a monitor. You have to be able to draw. You have to be able to run a camera, you know, run a dark room or whatever. You know, you have to create a style out of these, uh, out of the material and out of the uh, forms of, of uh, uh, the mechanics. So, John, you, you, you have to look backwards in order to look forwards. Yes. Yeah. So analog and digital are these two forms, multi-forms, that you have to, as a student, you have to know both really well. Because you can't depend on you can't depend upon having you can't get any money out of the digital world because it's, the system takes all the money. Yeah. So you have to be an artist on the other hand, so that you have a control over the rights, and so you don't want to sell out your rights. So you hold on to your rights, and that and that's the way you make a studio. So I have always hung on to my rights as an analog person. I could draw, you know, and I could take photographs. And I could work as a designer for him. So working as a designer, I lost all the credit, you know, and, and the copyright that became assumed by the company. Um, uh, and the campaign, I, my name was not on the campaign, the company owns it. So yeah. you, have to go, you have to go back and say, okay, I have a drawing here that, that, that I've done. Um, and I own the copyright and I'll sell you the copyright for X amount of dollars. And so, so there's where you, where you have two things. You have labor and then you have the rights to negotiate. So that makes a different kind of studio. So the analog gives you the, the copyright. 
Yes. And so if you don't, if you don't learn that mm-hmm. and you stick to the, uh, the monitor, you know, or the computer, uh, the technology moves so fast that it can move faster than you and you're left behind by a particular machine, you know, a particular a broadcasting system. That's the difficulty. So how do you make okay. a life out of, uh, out, of, out of technology expending itself? one layer after another. Then you have audiences, then you have have audiences. So we have Gen Z now, we don't have uh, boomers anymore. You know, they're dying every day. So it's an, you know, so you really can't depend, you you know, on the record business, you can't depend upon all those old names because their bands have died and all that. And they're just, they're, they're just rights that are owned by the company. So, uh, so what happens is that, <clears throat> and how do you start new forms? Well, you have to go, you know, you have to go analog into the studio, turn it into digital, and then, and then be piped out through the internet, you know, and through television and all that. And, and, uh, and hopefully that's what goes on today, you know, and then you have this Gen Z, which is a different value system. You know, they don't know the, they don't know the analog at all. They're just TV and monitors and, and desktop machines. You know, we have, we have to reteach them. Pardon me? We have to reteach them. Well, that's, that's the multi-form. In my class on, on 60s music, I play them records. You know, I have a record player here and the old yeah. vinyls. And, you know, you can't understand anything about 60s music without the technology back in the 60s. Yeah. Um, and I want to ask you one more thing. You talked about your own multidisciplinarity, growing up with your your parents, um, science, uh, art, and everything in between. Uh, how important is it for young people to be interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary? Well, that's about awareness. You have to have people guiding you. You have to latch on to somebody that goes to it goes to art events and museums and all that, and you get into dialogue with them. You know, then uh, uh, people in science. You know, then you have to then go with them to all the science events and all the inventions and all the technologies. You know, so then you get to learn all that. You know, and then um, yeah, then so that's the that's the engineering and the art. It's as simple as that. Now, when we talk about the Multidiscipline. Then there's those are forms. So you have the art form, you have the um, um, you have the design form, and you have the uh, technology form. Mm-hmm. So basically, you're saying they're all the same thing. Yes. Yeah. But you know, uh, they're not the same thing. They're just you train for them. So so where we were in the '60s is we were coming out of the Bauhaus. You know, modernism. Mm-hmm. Uh, into postmodern, that was the track house and, and televisions and, and weird cars and all that. So uh, then that all settled down by the 70s. And then as it went into 80s, you know, the computer took over with the car, took over the car in the manufacturing. Then, you know, everything became computerized and every product was somehow another digital or connected to a digital thing, the barcode. You know, that's all products suffer from that. Um, okay, so uh, John, this was amazing. And before you go, everybody who's on You've Got Mail gets asked the same question at the end of the show. What okay. is your favorite Beatles song? Favorite Beatles song? Uh, uh, Sergeant Pepper, I think. Um, the Lonely Hearts Band, what is that? Um, uh, the, the first song in, in Sgt. Pepper? Yeah. Or Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Cub Band. Yeah. That's your favorite? That's my favorite. Brilliant. Anything else I should have asked you and I haven't asked you? Um, well, you did ask about posters, and that's really what I do in the design world, you know. And so the Endless Summer has been um, sold for 50 years, something like that. It's going that, into 60 that, that poster kind of made your career. <clears throat> right. Well, we go back to 
being on surfing magazines, you know, and doing this um, um, for a, in a little town with really just you know kind of minimal people that didn't really have any connection to the world but only surf makes a film that's two hour you know that, that takes two uh, two uh, years to make and then and then uh, eventually over a four year period of time while I'm in art school and this and that uh, it it, uh, it is, explodes in New York and I become a New York designer based upon the the celebrity of that poster. So then that's where that comes into the Capitol records is that I'm coming from art school, you know, and they see that poster and they connect me to being a major person from New York. Incredible. Yeah. The picture that made you- So then, uh, and so then I, uh, around in 69, I was in London with uh, Eric Clapton and, and this whole uh, oh. group of people. Yeah. What's, what's Eric Clapton like? Uh, uh, quiet. So he went to art school and he was a friend of Martin Sharp's. They both went to you know, the academy there. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, with all the, the hash and everything, people were just uh, nodding, you know, hi, how are you? You know, and someone would tell a story. It wasn't like the surf business where the sun goes, you know, the surf goes down and everyone forms a circle. They tell stories all day long. You know, being stoned and uh, after nine was like a whole kind of social life in its own right. So, um, so Clapton, so I'm, I'm in his mini and, you know, and, and, and in discussions with him and art shows and, you know, on King's Road and all that. So I come back to LA. So, in, you know, that's like 1969. So 2005, I meet the manager of, of Claire Clapton who lives out here. And, um, and so he, he sees the Hendrix poster and he sees the Endless Summer poster and he wants to buy them. So he buys them, you know? And then he likes the Hendrix so well that he paints his staircase hallway the same color as the, uh, as the poster, the blue. So then we're on the phone and he said, you know, uh, I was just talking to Eric the other day. He, he knows you. And I said, yeah, I met him in London a long time ago. You know? um, <clears throat> so, um, he says, you know, we need a poster. We can't pay you, but we need a poster for his London opening of the, of the cream, the reunion. And so would you do it? And I said, sure, knowing exactly how it works. So, <clears throat> oops, sorry. Right. So the way it works is that the licensee is in, in uh, London. And so we do the poster in, uh, in Santa Monica and put the digital thing together. And so it's a drawing and all the, you know, the negotiations of it and everything. So, so it, it's all printed and then, or, or let's say the film is made and it's sent to London and then they, they print it there. <clears throat> so they're printing it. Instead of doing a limited edition of 1500, they just, they only do 500. So one day, you know, while the concert is starting or something like that, uh, uh, Nigel's on, on his cell phone. He holds it up in the air at the arena. You know, he says, can you hear them? And he says, your poster sold out in two hours. So uh, he said, We're, we'll, be dead. we'll be down for like two days and we'll print some more. So I printed another thousand and that came to the, uh, to the, to the hall and those were gone in one day, you know? So uh, uh, that was a hit. All right, so they put a postcard on all this chairs, you know, all the seats, the seating. And so that little postcard was the same size as a cassette. And so they were doing a DVD. So. Um, I hand, the, I hand a, a, a cartridge with the uh, handbill on it to, to Nigel. He goes out to Warner Brothers. He walks into an office and there's the guy with the same thing. So then they have to negotiate with me. So the guy gets on the phone and he says, I, you know, we're not going to pay you for anything. Uh, you don't have the rights to it. And I said, well, I have a deal with this, with the, with the band. And they just discarded it. So so they so Warner Brothers passes it to Rhino. Rhino is the distributor, and so somebody gets on the phone from from uh, Rhino and, and says, uh, "Okay, uh, we understand you own the rights to this, and we want to publish it. Um, 
what do we do here? We have to make a deal. And I said, they said, uh, we really don't want to pay you anything. You know, because the band's in control. You know, well, I know the band, the manager and everything. So I tell them, you can't have it. It's $10,000. You know, uh, in 1969 on the Jefferson Airplane, uh, I put in a bill to RCA for $9,000. And they <clears throat> and they wouldn't uh, and they wouldn't pay it, and I held the the rights, and finally the check came. So, <laughs> so that was a tactic I knew very well. So um, so we have this rapport with uh, uh, Tower, and so Tower Tower's management and Rhino's management get into a deal together where they're going to uh, sell the the album and they're going to sell the the uh, cassette um, the video. And so I end up in this position where uh, they say, well, aren't you going to sign them? And he says, sure. You know, well, we have 17 stores. So, uh, OK, we'll have a tour. So we have a tour. So we went around the country to 17 different stores of Tower Records and did signings and then went to Canada and came back down. I must have made 40,000. <laughs> That's the way it works. Incredible. Everybody's saying, no, we can't pay you. <laughs> and you know why? It's the same way, the same way they, the company works is they have to get their money from the rich. Yeah. They don't have any money. They have to call up somebody who will uh, toss a million dollars in, you know, then they, can, then they can pay for things. So those advances for their albums, you know, you know would be like 500,000, a million dollars. For it, for it to, to prop up the studio and the making of all that, the entourage and all that. Meals, hotels, you know, plane trips. Incredible. That's the carnival aspect, you know, is the spending of the money. That's what yeah. Hollywood is so well known about. And then uh, I was in therapy for like probably 12 years in this transition of, of getting out of Hollywood the arrogance of Hollywood. And how, how do I redesign myself to work in the ordinary world with business people? So that was a long uh, understanding, you know, is that your unconscious was unconscious in the music business or in the entertainment business. And then once you leave, you have to become conscious. And that transition from fantasy to reality, uh, a lot of people lose their life in that transition, the depression, being isolated, being left, left, left alone. So, you know, within, within Hollywood, let's say I would, I would see, a, a, I would go to a party and there would be a, a kid there playing the guitar and he had the, have the, the uh, lyrics uh, on little pieces of paper pasted to his guitar. So then the next year I would see him on TV you know, then the next year he was uh, doing concerts everywhere. So the, the fourth year there were interviews and all that. And then in the fifth year, I was walking down Selma Avenue, you know, to one of the studios and there's this car there and, and the door is open and there's the star, you know, kind of passed out, all fucked up. That's the way it was. That's the way it was. And if you didn't cope yeah. with the reality. It's a real... Uh... It's a real roller Well, John, listen, uh, this has been a real roller coaster ride. Um, if you haven't written your autobiography, you really need to, man. It's yeah, I have story. one. Yeah, there's uh, 25 years living in uh, or growing up in, in uh, 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 Southern California. That's uh, John Van Hammersfeld, My Art, My Life. That's a book that's wonderful. Uh, so, so and then, uh, there's the, then there's a design book, which is 50 years of graphic design. So by please, John Van uh, please add some links be underneath this uh, interview afterwards. Okay. So, uh, so uh, well, give that give that to Alita, and then she'll yeah. follow up. Yeah. Alita will follow up. So, yeah. uh, John, this has been. He manages the whole thing. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Listen, this has been incredible. I consider myself extremely fortunate to uh, be able well, to- Well, you never this. hear this, you know? You never- No. You never hear it. No. You know, you, you are not allowed. But with the internet and Zoom and all this, all of a sudden, you know, people can have conversations about, yeah. you know, the relativity of their career and who they became and 
things that became what they are. Yeah, so this is incredible. I want to thank Perez for uh, for introducing us. Yes. Uh, hi, Perez. And um, hopefully we'll actually get to, to uh, actually meet one, one another someday. But in the meantime, this has been outstanding. Uh, yeah. John Van Hammersfeld, I want to thank you for being on You've Got Mel. Okay, I hope I, I hope I was okay. Was you were, you were, you were mar <laughs> you're responsive. You're marvelous. You know, when I would meet when I would meet Jack, Mick Jagger, you know, you barely talk. You know? uh, so you know, it's just the way the star system works. So be, being a little bit uh, taken into reality, I actually can, and have distance, I can look at it and talk about it. Absolutely, it was wonderful. All right, John, thanks. Thanks so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Take Thank care. Thank you very much. Yeah, this gets distributed. <laughs> This is widely distributed, but uh, you don't have any copyrights, and I don't have any copyrights. Um, yeah. And uh, it'll be on Facebook forever and YouTube forever. Oh, and, great. Uh, and people should know what an incredible human being you are. Oh, great. And send that to me on, uh, send that to me on Facebook, the finish. Of course. Yeah, of course good. I shall. I'll, All send, right. I'll, send, I'll probably send it to Alida. Okay. <laughs> Take All care. right, see you later. Thank you so much. Thank you.